So kia ora koutou, um, welcome everyone who is here and everybody who is joining us remotely on the live stream. Hi. Um, yep, everyone in the crowd, please turn around and wave to the camera. Great. So um, it's really lovely to see those of you who are here tonight and thank you for coming. The weather in Wellington, for those who aren't here, has been pretty grotty today. And I've got to say, I thought a few of you might decide to just stay at home or at your offices and hunker down. So I feel very privileged that you braved the weather to come and um, hear from us tonight and, and chat with us and network with each other. So cool to have you here. Um, so a little bit of the structure of what we're doing tonight, this is not lots and lots of talking heads, but what we wanted to be able to do is talk a little bit to all of you about what we learned from the work we did last year um, and what we learned from working with all of you or what we think we learned um, and what we saw and then a little bit of um, what's coming up in 2018. So the way we'll do it is I'll be talking a little bit about at the kind of macro level and then um, our program managers Alison and Jodie and Rach are going to tell you a little bit more of the detail from their individual programs. Um, we'll have a chance to, if you want to, ask questions. Um, we can treat this since it's a small audience here in a fairly intimate way so if you've got questions um, yell and we'll repeat the question back. The reason I'm holding this big teddy bear and it's not making my voice any louder is so that the people on live stream can hear us. Okay, so that's why it's a bit odd. Okay, so um, so the things um, the things that I I think I really started to notice in 2017 that made me feel really optimistic about the work we're all, all trying to do in the world is this rise and rise of business leadership. And when I say that, I mean kind of CEO and senior leadership leadership that um, what I saw happening over and over again is um, our CEOs starting to really step into public spaces to talk about the things that matter to, to all of us obviously but also to New Zealand and so you know I saw some of your CEOs stand up and talk about climate change and really try and lead on that as a conversation some of them stand up and talk about water and other issues that matter so for me that was a really um, that was a really significant sign that the sustainability conversation is sort of starting to to uh, get mainstream, but also that we've got more people engaged with trying to make the changes that we're all trying to make. Um, the other thing that has um, really surprised and delighted me is the sustainable development goals. Like um, those of you who came to Better Futures with Colmar Brunton, you know, 28% of New Zealanders know about the SDGs and the government isn't talking about them and media have been pretty clear that they're kind of not a framework that's easy for them to talk about. So how are New Zealanders finding out? But then on top of that, we've been really surprised and impressed by the number of you who are using the Sustainable Development Goals in your reporting. So um, Ali's been leading our member of you process and we've been, w there are a lot more of you reporting against the SDGs than we had expected. So really, um, that's pretty exciting actually that um, New Zealand businesses have kind of got so quickly on board and saying how do we connect what we're doing to global, global goals. Um, the third and really relevant for our hard-headed business people is the shifts we're starting to see from investors, shareholders and capital. Um, I talked about the Larry Fink letter at Better Futures for those who are there, but you know we are really now starting to see those people who have money and who are really interested in the impacts of the businesses that they're investing in, starting to say, actually, we, we want to see more from you, we need you to be more transparent, and actually we need you to be taking these issues seriously because this is about you know better society and better environment for all of us. And I, that is starting to have a really material impact, I think, on how people are thinking about these things. It's, you know, I don't want to overstate it because it's still reasonably early days, but the signals are getting stronger and stronger. And, you know, for, the, for those of us who have to work with CFOs, you know, being able to have those kinds of conversations really helps them understand the value that we're creating as sustainability people. So that was, those were some of the things I really saw in, in kind of as emerging trends in 2017. In terms of what I'm a bit focused on for 2018, or quite a lot focused on in 2018, is really we've set ourselves the purpose to help businesses be the best for New Zealand and the world. And we've done a lot of work with the team. Some of it they will tell you was very tortuous around how, our, how we make our strategy real and really make sure that we're delivering that for you. Our, the impact we want to have in the world is we want sustainability to be mainstream in New Zealand business. And you know I've got some interesting questions to answer about how we'll know and what mainstream in New Zealand business looks like, but we are sort of working on that. But the way we're gonna do that, our way of operating, is we want to inspire, by, inspire business by creating a community of positive change, helping you, our members, to go further, and then celebrating your success in leadership. We think that's the way that we can connect 
helping you guys be the best for New Zealand with having that impact. So you'll see more of us thinking about how we do that, trying to get more and more sophisticated over time. And then the other thing that I thought was absolutely fascinating was the conversation we had with our advisory board. Now for those of you who don't know, we have an advisory board of um, 16, 15 or 16 members and it's um, kind of the great and the good from our membership. So we have some CEOs, some CFOs, some marketing people, um, some partners and we're really starting to use them to help us think about what the future is going to look like, really help us to think about what are the things that we as SBC need to be getting ready for now so that when you guys are starting to find these as barriers or problems or challenges, we've done a little bit of thinking. And so we did that with them at the back end of last year and they had some pretty interesting things that they wanted us to have a look at. Um, some of it won't surprise you, so climate change doesn't go away, for instance, and natural resources and what's happening with our natural assets doesn't go away. But the things that they were interested in us starting to explore included, because the list was long, as you might imagine, the future of work. And I think they all had different takes on what that might mean, but that's you know, automation, that's digitisation, it's um, AI, artificial intelligence, it's the potential for large segments of our workforce to be displaced. It's the fact that you know 40% of the jobs which exist now won't in a fairly short period of time. So there is a huge um, groundswell of change coming in our workplaces and they are to a greater or lesser extent, you guys, some of you are thinking about that, some of you aren't ready to think about it, some of us haven't got our heads around what it looks like yet. So they've asked us to look at that, which is pretty exciting. The second, which was um, even more surprising, was and um, there were different ways they talked about this depending on who they were, either the future of capitalism or how the system shares wealth. So they've really asked us to start to think about how, how is the system in, inside which we're operating, you know, what, what is it that we can be thinking about to start to influence that for different outcomes, which is massive, so please don't expect us to come back to you with a solution to that, but they have asked us to start to bring some thinking to that that might be useful for our membership. And then the final, and I think this is really interesting and I'm personally really passionate about this, is the Treaty of Waitangi. That, that, that this is definitely on the radar as an issue that business is going to have to start to get its head around. And um, I was reminded speaking to Jodie today that you know when we, use, when we talk often to senior leadership teams about the treaty, it feels like a very politicised conversation and I think part of, part of what we need to be starting to think about how we step into is actually the treaty is our foundational constitutional document and what does that mean for us as businesses. So that just gives you a bit of a sense of the kinds of things that we are going to be starting to have to think about and tackle as a team. So if you've got insight or perspectives or questions or anything like that, please do come and talk to us. We, we haven't started this work yet. Um, we think about the way we work in kind of three phases. The first is really around exploration, the second is around design and co-design, and then the third is implementation. So we're a way off from really nailing what that work will look like, but the team is starting to frame up what our process could be for those things now. So that's really all I was going to talk to you about. I do want to finish off by saying a really massive thank you to my excellent team. I was saying to one of the team today, um, that one of the things that makes me feel really good and smug is what an excellent recruiter I am. Um, I ha have got a pretty extraordinary group of people that I'm working with to do this work and, um, and I've watched them engage with all of you over the past of the last couple of years and just seen how much change they're leading to. So a big thank you to you guys. And without further ado, I think it's now my turn to hand over to Alison, but shall I just do a brief pause in case anyone wants to comment or just ask anything before we hand over? There will be lots of time to do this at the end, but just in case there's a burning question. Um, I wear a few hats in the team. One of them is leading the consumer decision-making uh, projects. Uh, so it's been a really exciting time. There's a big shift in the world with consumer expectations and perceptions, um, and a lot of work to be done in this area for business. So the recent highlights um, just in the last few months have been the workshop that I know a lot of people here and in Auckland are at, uh, connecting your brand story with sustainability, and the Coma Brunt, Brunt and Better Futures report launch, which um, we had Meridian speaking as well as Coma Brunt and SBC. Uh, there are over 100 people at those, and that includes quite a large live stream uh, group as well. So very, very solid engagement that there's a lot of questions people want answered and want to talk to others about. Um, so what that's telling us is that our, the businesses in our memberships, they really want to know what consumers think 
and they want to know how to connect with them. So we'll continue in 2018 to bring you this leading research. I've um, got a few things coming up and we'll announce those soon. Uh, it's also, we've got a collaboration that we're going to start from March onwards to develop a New Zealand version of the Good Life Playbook, which we flagged briefly last year. Uh, so this, is, this will look at changing brands' visual communications and advertising to reflect a more sustainable world. So this is localising the work done by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And um, it's going to be a really interesting process just going through that to see who we talk to, what gets talked about, and what perspectives we get from stakeholders around New Zealand. We're going to be publishing some commentary on the sustainability angles of some consumer and marketplace issues. So at the moment, uh, things we get that uh, asked about and looks like hot topics are the blockchain as mechanism for trust and transparency and sustainability reporting, um, web-based sustainability reporting, how that works with your uh, hard copy PDFs, one or the other, or standalone. And we're going to be following on from the work done in the professional development program of last year, the Future Leaders Program, to look at developing a short visual piece that will show what New Zealand could look like in the future if the transition to a low emissions economy goes ahead. What would that look like if that actually happens and what would it look like in 20, 30 years? And I think that's going to be a lot of fun as well as interesting to see what ideas um, make it into that piece. Um, another hat that I wear is the member review process and uh, that's been really fascinating. We get to see a lot of the sustainability information from all our members, um, a lot of conversations about what people are doing and what they want to do. So just a sneak preview of where we've got to, we're part way through it and just a sneak preview of the analysis so far. So what we can see is um, that there's more comprehensive stakeholder engagement um, than we'd seen in the last member review and there seems to be more clarity on stakeholder needs. Um, we can see a more explicit inclusion of ethics and human rights in supply chain policies and criteria and it seems to be increasingly made clear as a core value for many companies. We're seeing some great examples of how sustainability is structured and governed within a business. And there's always work to be done and areas to improve. So we're going to keep going with supporting members on some of the fundamentals from just reporting, what it looks like, what does good look like, how do you do it, um, sustainable procurement, carbon measurement, and stakeholder engagement and that will be through some of the one-to-one -one feedback webinars and events and the work program. Um, I'm just going to give you a rundown on communications because Renee can't be here tonight she's unfortunately unwell. So just she wanted to highlight uh, some of the things that she's seen as highlights are the members achievements in sustainability and that SBC has done a really good job at identifying the emerging trends in sustainable business and getting that out to media. Um, there's been a lot of really good support for members in their storytelling and a lot of work going into building better media relations to keep those stories going and the momentum going. Um, so this will build on the work done in 27 to broaden the range and reach of communications channels. And there will be some new or expanded activities such as, um, so now we use three social media platforms and we have a growing reach to highlight member work and achievements. We're growing the readership of the Pānui, uh, so it's going out to a wider and wider stakeholder list, including government policy advisors and mainstream news media. Um, we're increasing the Insight blogs, which is just some of our more, um, some of the insights that we have that's more for members and it can capture a particular perspective at a time. And more innovative collaborations with news media. Um, one that's looking to be really interesting is uh, the possibility of some workshops um, that will aim to get members great innovation stories out there. So this will be to help build a better understanding of what business is doing to tackle climate change and some of the big environmental issues of our time. So the purpose will be to mainstream media audiences, to show mainstream media audiences that business is coming up with real solutions and that's about action. So there'll be no, uh, more news on those workshops shortly. Uh, tēnā koutou. 
ngā mihi nui ke koutou, uh, ko te tirangi te maunga, ko waio te awa, ko taki te mutu waka, uh, ko nga te kangonu te iwi, ko nga tamatarangi te hapu, uh, ko rangiahua te marae, ko Jodie Hamilton taku ingoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou kato. Um, so it's really great to be able to share with you where we're headed, where we've been and where we're headed on social impact. Um, it, it has been an exciting time, particularly with the new government and their sort of their new focus on youth employment. So we've seen some things come in, um, such as fees-free um, policies, a, a focus on apprenticeships, a, you know, refocus on apprenticeships, um, a focus on creating uh, environmental and community um, jobs through key projects. Um, we've seen a focus on youth entrepreneurship. And of course, all of those things um, come into that space where we're looking to impact around social impact. So, so, so SBC Social Impact Agenda, its sole focus is about working with our members on your recruitment and employment um, opportunities to support more vulnerable young New Zealanders into sustainable employment. And the three sort of key target groups that we've really focused on based on research and, uh, and, and also member input and, and partner input, have, have they are young sole parents, um, young people with uh, health and uh, mental health and disability conditions, and then also young Māori. When we were scoping um, the new phase of the project, uh, we went to the board and looked at where we could probably best invest um, our efforts and put our efforts. So we are continuing with working in Auckland um, in this space. And then in terms of what was going on around regional New Zealand, the board also said, let's have a look at Northland and the Hawke's Bay. And the reason being that in that 18 to 24 year old um, age group, in Auckland there's 11,000 uh, young people on income support, on main benefits, and in both Northland and the Hawke's Bay there's about 2,500 in each of those regions. So it's a, a really compelling case for us. Now, um, this is my full disclosure and um, a bit of background as to why I'm so committed to this space and why my heart is there. Um, I do have a, a six-year-old son and um, so both myself and his father, obviously Māori, and, and he physically looks very Māori. And um, what I know about data and, and what goes on for our young Māori boys in, in this country is that he's significantly less likely to participate in early childhood education. And then once he gets into the school system, he's three times more likely to be suspended he's significantly less likely to achieve his NCEA credits, particularly level three. And, uh, and even if he, uh, he's, he's significantly less likely, about two times less likely to be uh, employed. Um, even if he is employed, he'll earn about $6,000 less than um, the average uh, income of his non-Māori peer. And I guess where that all culminates for me is that um, as a young Māori boy in this country, he's two and a half times more likely to kill himself. And so that's an unacceptable position. And that's what drives me um, to be in this space. And sits behind the work, certainly, that, that I do and, and we collectively do with um, SBC's social impact area. So. This year, um, we've done some really exciting things. So since July, we partnered up with ATEED uh, in Auckland, the Economic Development Agency in Auckland. And uh, we, we held, co-hosted an event, which a number of our members attended, where we looked at that bigger picture around supporting um, our members and then other employers in Auckland to be, um, the, the name of the event was actually Future Ready, but it was about being ready, our businesses, our employers, our members being ready to employ young people. So that was in July, and, uh, and then coming out of that, we had a number of our members put up their hands and say, I actually want to get more involved uh, and understand 
the practicalities of what I can do. So before Christmas we held an event uh, in Auckland where we pulled together a number of our members with a couple of service providers in Auckland who have responsibilities and contracts with the government around getting um, young people, vulnerable young people, into work. So they've got employment placement contracts and, um, and case management contracts for want of a better word. And, and they were able to share some fantastic insights about, uh, about what we know works in terms of the, the target groups of young people that we, that we want to work with. So looking ahead, the sorts of things that we're doing is in Auckland we're really focusing on that space of brokering our, the relationship between our members and those different types of organisations that are working with young soul parents, young Māori. And, uh, and young people who have got health and disability conditions. And just uh, looking at where we can build relationships that uh, are sustainable without SBC in fact being involved directly. So that's our focus over the next um, six months in, in Auckland through social impact. Through the Hawke's Bay it's slightly different. Um, we are working closely with an organisation, they're a business there, whose sole purpose is around uh, connecting with young unemployed people and moving them into the labour market, supporting them to move into jobs. And, uh, and so we'll be having an event in the near future um, to further bring in those relationships with our members, so employers, to uh, help build those pathways of young unemployed people in the Hawke's Bay region into work. And in Northland it's a slightly uh, different focus as well. So we've got some members that have got a, a, a key footprint uh, in, in Northland with their operations and we're actually uh, working on developing some key relationships with the Ministry of Social Development up there because obviously they work every day with um, unemployed young people. So a slightly different approach um, in each of the three regions. Now we are focusing on results. Our commitments that have come through um, the advisory board are that we work with 10 members to achieve 50 employment outcomes across the three regions. And I'm really excited to say that we are already making some really good progress around that. Um, but we will definitely be, be putting our um, foot on the accelerator over the coming months and, um, and, and seeing you know, how we go with achieving what we want to achieve. As we draw to a close with this particular phase of social impact, we will also be continuing to build case studies and sharing insights across our members in terms of what's gone well and also some tools tools too. Um, and then Abby's already mentioned that the conversation around the future of work is, is coming through um, really strongly and we have no doubt that the social impact work that we're doing at the moment will also um, support that work as it, as it goes forward. Um, so thank you uh, for, for being here and, um, and yeah, ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I'm representing three of us today, so um, excuse the obvious personality disorder or schizophrenia or AI kind of induced state as I work out my way through this. So Rob uh, Perry is based in Auckland and he leads a program of work that's about leadership development um, and he also does some work in natural resources centre uh, sector. He um, wanted me to share with you that his presence is helping change our gender mix within our team and that that's really important. Uh, so I've shared that with you. And uh, just in terms of his reflections on highlights for 2017, and excuse me as I just check notes on these because um, it is his work. So really successful Future Leaders Programme uh, and we had 25 participants, four workshops, five collaborations and some really significant thinking that's helped influence our work programme for the coming year. For example, on implementation of sustainable development goals, what member kind of uh, commitments and challenges and opportunities are around that. So that, um, that was a highlight from his point of view. The second was the incorporation or the adoption by the NZX of SBC's recommendations on uh, the Code of Corporate Governance, which is about 
reporting on non-financial matters for those companies listed on the ASX. So quite significant highlights around shifting the dial on main, mainstreaming. Um, for the next 12 months, uh, we're really conscious about getting to different audiences and part of one of those audiences that we would like to have some conversations with our directors. And so Rob uh, has successfully convened quite a number of directors to a dinner in April, such that today he told us that he had more knocking on the door and wanting to get in, which is always a lovely way to work. Um, and, and so working alongside directors to build fellowship, help increase the way that they think about the long-term challenges around economic and social incorporation into kind of governance uh, in particular. We'll be inviting applications for sustainable leadership program in um, April 2018 and that's the leadership development program this time round targeted at experienced sustainability and business leaders and general managers um, who have accountability for sustainability and it will focus on looking at innovative new ways of thinking and working on complex issues and the kind of partnerships that you need to create to get that change and the, the, the nature of different kinds of collaboration. So that's um, super exciting. Watch the space for April requests for uh, applications. So that's Rob's area of work. I'm now gonna move on to climate and what we've been doing on climate action. And this is just a shout out to Kate Alcock, who some of you know, and I am privileged enough to be having a guardianship of her role for the coming year while she is off having a baby, which is due next Wednesday, and she finished work on Friday last week. So we're all waiting with bated breath for uh, this little new person to arrive in the world. And she has done um, some really, interesting work over the last year, which in terms of highlights started with pulling together in partnership with you, the submission for the Productivity Commission review of transitioning to a low carbon economy. And from that, noticing actually working across the membership, what quite large goals were being set, really ambitious goals being set by companies. Um, for example, net zero targets to 2050, keeping within two degrees of warming to 2050, net zero targets to 2040, even to 2030, and getting a sense of a change and how could we harness that change in order to build on it. And that then led Kate and Abby to work together on what about if we reflect and get together a group of chief executives and talk, get them to talk to each other about the kind of ambition they set, they're setting and how that might help them feel a little bit competitive about setting some more ambition and some bigger ambition. And that's really led to the development of uh, them working on a climate uh, leadership commitment, which is pretty much formed and from that, I guess one of the highlights of this year will be what they want to do with that next. And the first step is to meet with Minister Shaw and share that with him in March, talk about their ambition, and then look to coerce, cajole, and invite more businesses to sign up to talk about how we we get that into action and that then also gives us an opportunity to tell all the stories that your businesses are, um, of the action your businesses are taking and reflecting that back. And from that learning about how we can help a wider group of members. So that's the kind of leadership piece. Um, the other area that was a highlight um, from Kate's point of view was talking about the climate action groups. So we have a number of climate action groups where people are able to join and we are encouraging them to work uh, 
with our support but on their own ideas and collaboration with each other about how they might take action forward in areas of transport for example or on leadership and we have uh, as part of their work this year late last year launched the PACE website which you can find it sits on our platform and where there are a whole lot of tools and advice about how to start on a low carbon journey uh, and we're just looking at pulling together the stats for that but our early feedback is really positive and it has actually come to the attention of wider groups working in this area like Pure Advantage for example who are, who are helping encourage their members to use the tools that our climate action groups have developed so that's super positive. I guess there's two other things that we wanted to talk about for this coming year that we'll be working on and one is about setting science-based targets so how you help galvanise your business on a low carbon plan and generally one of the first ways of doing that after you've measured what your carbon is is going right what kind of target do we want to set and now there are a whole lot of businesses setting quite ambitious targets and we've got a government that's talking about net zero to 2050 and working out what that means so what does it mean for business for themselves to decarbonise and how do they take themselves on that path for that and science-based targets is one way of doing that. We're working with Enviromark, it's nice to have you here today and also with WWF on designing some workshops for that. I can tell you that as much as it's not yet fully formed the first workshop will be on the 5th of April and that will be come along and find out about science-based targets they sound scary, they're not, will help demystify them. And from that, invite those of you who'd like to go on and actually work on what you think your target might be, what it means for your sector, how you might model that target in your business um, from there. And that, they'll happen kind of a couple of months after that. So we should be through those by about June, July. And then, and then the final piece that I wanted to talk about is just this work we're doing on, on systems. So how do you better get people to work together on climate action? And we know there are lots of organisations and people working and if we can get them to work together, we'll be, we'll be able to accelerate the change. And I think we all feel probably a sense of urgency around that. So that is MFE, ECA, Pure Advantage, um, EDS, WWF and us. And we think there's an area of common purpose that we can work on together. That's a co-design process. So what do we all think we can put our hands up on and, uh, and work on? And, and it's about what's the action we need to take now, pre-2020, to set ourselves up on this pathway for for change and we'll share the outcomes of that with you along the way and from that we think there'll be opportunities to highlight action members are taking and talk about how you build that pathway. So quite a lot in there. Um, feel free to ask questions, email, you know, send your thoughts through. We're really keen that, that what we do in the Climate Action Programme works for our members. So. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions which we'll welcome. Where am I handing to now? Back to you. It isn't almost empty. No one is to notice it's almost empty. Um, so for those of you on live stream who have just been enormously impressed by um, the previous presenter and her articulateness in talking about these things, that's Rachel Dupree um, who has joined our team to cover um, to cover Kate's maternity cover, I, I think Rach introduced herself to everyone in the room. But for those of you who are on the other end of the on the other end of the line, um, Rachel's been with us for um, four weeks now. You wouldn't know that, would you? The extent to which she can speak so fluently about what we've got on. Um, before we before I ask you if you've got any questions and we have a bit more of a conversation. Uh, one of the things which I have spoken about before, so sorry for those of you who've heard this, but the thing that I feel really proud of, and you guys have been part of this really significantly so I think, is that last year when PwC surveyed New Zealand CEOs, 38% of them said that climate change and environmental degradation was a serious business risk. This year, 
when they surveyed CEOs, 69% said that climate change and environmental degradation is a serious business risk. So thank you, because we have shifted our CEO audience in a year by a really, really significant margin. And that 69% compares to 50% globally and 52% in Australia. So, <coughs> so from my perspective, part of our job is to help our businesses be ready for the change that's coming. And so thank you to you guys, because this means if our CEOs get it, that we are helping our businesses be ready for um, a low carbon future. So that's awesome. So now it's over to you. Have you got any questions? Is there anything you'd like to say? I can hand you the talking stick. You can talk to the big teddy bear. Steve will turn the camera to face you, or you don't have to. You can ask a question and I'll ask it and answer it. So yeah, any, anything anyone wants to add, say, ask, offer. Um, if you want to do a wire, that's fine too. You have to do a wire now, Alison. Now I've suggested that. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to? Is it a long question? Because I can hand you the teddy bear, or hand him hand. Okay, that's not a long question. Steve, I think you're going to have to turn the camera to face Alison. Hi, live stream audience. Um, uh, I recently ran a little survey of. Um, the Wellington and Auckland sustainability managers groups, asking them, have any of them set targets? What kind of carbon accounting are you doing? And my concern was that there are a whole lot of companies that are signing up to zero carbon by a certain date. I'm like, what carbon is in and what carbon is out? And particularly with scope three emissions, I didn't see a lot of understanding in the survey responses that I got of kind of boundaries and evaluating value chains and I was like this could just be really messy and it felt like perhaps some sort of carbon 101 might <laughs> be useful. I was just wondering maybe if that could be added to the work program. I think we can go for carbon 102. <laughs> like they've set a target, so that's what I want. <laughs> um, so I'm going to answer a little bit of this, but actually I'll probably hand the talking sticks to Rach to... Uh, uh, look, if I'm honest, part of the way we think about these things is how do we create a sense of a burning platform and, uh, and a good place to start for people is to say, actually, yes, we get a burning platform and we're going to set a target, and then once you've got their signature on the page, then it's the time where you start to help them with the robustness. That's kind of, uh, you know, part of our theory of change. Probably a bit manipulative, but it works. Um, so, so I think um, that's a useful thing to be noting, and I think that's helpful in terms of the direction of travel, but you're absolutely right, we need the robustness that sits underneath it. Um, so Rachel, who's much better at robustness than I am, will talk about that. <laughs> Science-based targets. Nice, thank you. Uh, yes, so I agree. It's... Uh, Businesses all around the world are grappling with a boundary issue, and having come from a big, bus, you know, big European business, I know we were too. Uh, and as as more businesses grapple with it, it gets more complicated. So I think that's great feedback. Um, I would like to think that we have developed our market in New Zealand sufficiently that there are people who are able to offer carbon one hundred and one to some of our members should they need it. We have our Brilliant Basics program at the risk of doing yet another pass over to Alison. I'm not sure, do we have Carbon 101 in that? We did one in, this could probably keep it up for me. Uh, we did a, a, a 101 in June. Uh, that had a little bit of detail about the different scopes, some business examples of uh, different approaches. Um, as well as a bit of the business case, why people are doing it, how they are talking, what language are they using, how are they talking it to pe about it with people within their business that aren't sustainability managers. Uh, we are going to be doing another uh, Brilliant Basic on carbon this year, so if that's something you're seeing, we'd certainly have a look at having a bit more detail on the different scopes just to reinforce it for people who are already there and then to make others aware who haven't got there yet. I am now handing over to Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my tools. Well, he's got his tools. So Jerry Beale is um, uh, the leader of Tickled Pink, which is a, what a neat name for a brand. And so Jerry is a, a new one of our new members through True and the True um, organisation of companies. And True is famous with some of you, and I can think of some of our members who use a lot of True services for advertising. But what Jerry's really passionate about is purpose and happiness. And so tonight, you get the benefit of his leading edge thinking on happiness, which might surprise you, but um, we've discussed it, haven't we, Jerry? And we're we pretty have. confident that happiness is definitely 
definitely in the sustainability um, spectrum. So apologies for almost missing you. That's all right. That was really funny. I've never done that before. I'm very embarrassed. Right, over to you. Sorry for those of you on live stream. I hope you didn't leave. <laughs> and start thinking about questions you want to put through on the live stream questions because you'll have some for Jerry. Good evening, uh, and to the live stream, good evening. Um, it's a lovely small group, so I think I can talk a bit louder. If you can't hear, hear me, please tell me. Change has been a recurring theme through tonight, and I'm going to continue that theme. And I'm sure everybody here knows that sustainability is not just about the environment. It's also the people and the communities and the businesses that subsist within that environment. And it's obviously what I'm really, really focused on is how business can look after people better and how in doing that, business works better. So it's a nicely completing circle. And I've called this the new order for a reason. And I'd like this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, just sing out as we go. This is not a, a formal presentation. Um, business, uh, how it's conducted, the channels it's conducted through, and more importantly, the relationships business has with people has changed more in the last 10 years than the previous 100. <clears throat> and there has been a significant change in order. Anybody know Raj Sisodia, this man here? Um, he was the founder of the Global Conscious Capitalism Movement. So he's really, really, really big on the contribution business has to make to looking after the planet. And, and this is his challenge. We need to heal the planet and all life on it, which happens to include the people in the communities I've just talked about. Um, and all these companies, a few of them are here. Some are massive, massive global brands employing thousands upon thousands of people. Others are US centric. <clears throat> and there are many more, but I picked the big ones. Each one of these organizations has formally adopted this new order. And it impacts how they operate day by day, week by week, at every single tier of business. And what do they share? This. They put employees first, customers second, and shareholders third. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me. But to some people who still, if you like, go back to Milton Friedman's economics, a business leverages human capital to service customer needs to make shareholders wealthy. And that is gone. It is gone because the young people today who want to work in business won't put up with it. It's gone because it's not working for the planet and the environment. And it's gone because businesses simply cannot survive that way anymore. Put your people first. Put your customers second. Put your shareholders third. And guess what? The business make money anyway. Is there any questions or doubt about that? Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> I fully support it, but I'm not sure that all of the business actually managed to transition to that concept. I completely agree, and we'll get on to that. <laughs> That's partly why I'm here. But yeah. <clears throat> and this is, this is the sign that we have an issue. You know, worldwide, lead, Nine out of ten people go, I don't really like my work. I turn up, I do it, I go, oh, God, do it again tomorrow, and again tomorrow, and again tomorrow. And how many hours do we spend at work? In America, you know, the figure of 80% of Americans believe they're not regarded as a human being by their employer. And even th I mean, this country, six out of ten of us go to work not really wanting to be there. We don't really bring ourselves, bring our energy, our personality, our enthusiasm, <coughs> all of ourselves to work. And the employer misses out. You get a bit of me. And when somebody is fully present, as you know in any part of your life, I'm more confident, I'm more collaborative, I'm more courageous, I give more of myself, I work better with others. So anything which is systemized and requires contribution benefits. But today, it's not happening. <clears throat> and then you look, excuse me, at the impacts of stress, overwork, you know, relationships, whether it's f simply bad communication or active bullying, mistreatment of people. Heart attacks happen most often at 4 a.m. Monday morning before we get to work. And those impacts cost businesses billions every year. 
and then we lose our best people. The ones we've earmarked as the bright young stars, the future leaders, because they don't want to be here. They don't feel valued. They don't have a career path in their eyes. They don't think they're going to grow with the business. So they leave. We've got to go and find somebody else. We find somebody else. We've got to onboard them, train them up. It just keeps costing more and more and more and more and more. And what's called the war for talent is intensifying everywhere, especially in this country right now. We can't find enough good people. So this is a big, big problem. And it is silent to a degree. We don't get told about people not being happy at work because people don't want to look unhappy at work. They don't feel safe in doing that. And Raj, again, I love this blunt quote. In, in his words, most traditional old-style businesses are a source of hurting. Not necessarily intentionally, they don't know any better. And if we don't consciously choose to be part of the healing, we are part of the hurting. And that's an ouch. You know, given the role business has globally, the potential business has to create quantum change for the environment, for people and communities, this is a tragedy on every level. Yeah? Any, any comments, questions, challenges? Alrighty. Yet, when a business intentionally, through strategies, through management imperative, elevates the well-being and happiness of all employees, look what happens. And there are case study upon case study to prove this. Productivity goes up 50% almost because we want to be here together. Your bottom line goes up 22%. Employees actually want to contribute. They want to belong to something and feel a sense of satisfaction in achieving something together. Again, this is where purpose comes in. Your best staff stay. Finding more good staff becomes a damn sight easier. Innovation, because we're confident and courageous and collaborative, we find fresh ideas together. Innovation goes right up when the team is engaged. And people stay healthier. Even if there's no active encouragement, and there should be, people take more care of themselves because we're happy. There's a wonderful quote by a man called Brother David Sandler Rust, who's a Benedictine monk, does a lot of TED Talks. Somebody asked him once, he's a wonderfully sage, non-secular man. Someone says, how do I manage exhaustion? His answer was brilliant. Rest isn't always the answer. The antidote is wholeheartedness. So if I come to somewhere like my work, really wanting to be there and achieve something, I tend to feel healthier. I stay healthier. Um, and obviously your team, your every single employer, every tier, becomes the most vocal advocate for this business. Come and work here because. And you can't buy that. Okay? Um, but I still hear this. It's still out there. CEOs will go, we're a numbers business. I haven't got time to worry about happiness. And they look happy. Well, of course they look happy. They're acting happy because if you look unhappy, good chance you'll be fingered, you're not happy, you should be gone. People put on a mask to come to work and they go home and they cry into their tea or their beer going, I can't. another day, I can't stand it. Um, so it's out there. As you said, you know, some businesses in New Zealand haven't got this yet. And I think there's one which begins with F in the construction trade that is currently suffering from a situation. And they're a bloody good business. I've worked with them. But they're struggling to adapt to change. So this is the big point. Businesses that intentionally elevate the well-being and happiness, which is many things. So part of it is finding out what is happiness to your 50, 500, 5,000 employees. And very few CEOs, HR directors have the feedback loops the psychological understanding and the tools to harvest that data. And it's really, really important to know what it is. It's not the same for everybody. But if you do that across all employees, your business outperforms on every human and financial metric. And again, that's proven. And I can show you the case studies. So I go on? 
cool. And, you know, we're talking about looking after the environment, the people and the communities. Last week's Better Futures report told us this. In New Zealand, 73% of us want to work for a company that is socially and environmentally responsible. Do good. And this is a recurring theme, do good. And 64% will work for a company that pays them less if there are some shared strong values. So again, the, the recurring theme of purpose and values again crops up. Now I want to throw it open to you. I'll leave this up for a while. Th this is a, these are a selection of the drivers of workplace happiness globally. I'd like you to have a look and pick which two are most important to you. Whether they're most important to you and you don't currently experience it at work or they are currently in your workplace. Just two, only two. Okay, who had a sense of pride in my organization amongst their two, their favorite two? No? What about being treated with fairness and respect? Who had that amongst their two? Two of us? Feeling appreciated, which is more than respect, it's going well, you make a difference. So being appreciated at work. Two, two, three. That I'm surrounded by clear and transparent communication around me and about me. Cool. Um, that I'm supported with my health and well being. That there's a sense of accomplishment, particularly together, that together we're making a difference. Cool, awesome. I'm feeling empowered. I have a sense of self-management and control over my work. I'm not micromanaged. Nope. That there are healthy relationships around me and with me at work. That the organization I work for will share some of my values. Nice that the work we do has a positive social impact. There's a sense of belonging amongst the team. I'm part of something. And lastly, that by working here, I'll be helped to grow into a better version of me, not just around work. Awesome. So quite an even spread, yeah? All right, what, what the world thinks is this, and th th there are a few skews based on demographics, age and stage, but primarily the big five are give my work a sense of meaning. So that's purpose, social impact and accomplishment. Let me do something which has an impact, which is healthy. Number two is earn my trust through transparency. So again, share what needs to be shared. It's also about empowerment. Number three, it's helped me find some joy at work, happiness. Care enough to ask what it is for me and deliver it to me, even in little bits. Four, help me grow. Help me become the best version of myself, whether I stay here or not. Grow me as a human being. Um, and the last one is, recognize my achievements and celebrate together. So it gets both accomplishment and belonging. Now across all age groups, these five are the biggest. There's a slight skew towards younger people around give my work meaning, help me grow. Everybody wants to feel that there is transparency around them and that my achievements are recognized. All right. Um, Sean Acor, anybody come across him? Another well-known TED talker and author and happiness expert, I think he nails it. Happiness isn't fluffy. It isn't a soft metric, it's something you do once the business makes some money. Happiness drives performance. And it's only now becoming widely understood. It's been proven if your people are happy, your business makes more money, bluntly. And some examples of brands around the world. Some we know, some we might not know. <clears throat> and the key thing is, these companies didn't just randomly pick to do these things. They took the time to find out at the start what their people wanted 
and then found ways to deliver it. So clearly, Google employees told Google it was important they find time to do things that matter for them, their own projects. HBO, everything from quite smart graduates through to guys just packing boxes, wanted help me miss out on the qualifications I haven't got. Help me develop myself in different ways. So they're paying for education programs. Patagonia, I guess all around is a pretty amazing brand, but they, they oblige their suppliers to meet their own standards on sustainability and sourcing environmental impact. If you can't meet that, you won't work with us. I love that. And then two weeks ago, Perpetual Guardian down the road here announced they're going to trial a four-day working week. No increased hours, no drop in pay. Key is they're going to take the risk to see if it works. And a lot of these opportunities do involve some risk. But it's worth it. Yeah? Almost there. What we do, we work with CEO, CEOs, HR directors, and employee teams to help you find out what makes your team happy, how to deliver that, and how to align your entire team to a purpose that feeds back into happiness. That's all I'll say. There's a bit more there. Um, we've got a manifesto. There's some copies there if you'd like, but there's something which we share. Business is one of the most potent organizing forces for change in the world. Central to this is a commitment to growing employees to be the best they can be as workers, managers, team members, leaders, men, women, parents, partners, and members of the wider human community on Earth. Yeah? Sound good? And I'll leave you with this. Simon Sinek, do we know him? Very effective leadership coach. I love what he says. Inspiring man. And he nails it. The opportunity isn't to find the perfect company for me, or for ourselves. The opportunity is to build the perfect company for each other. We're in this together as employers and employees, as individuals and as communities. And it gets wider and wider and wider. And unless we as employees and we as employers start talking about how we do this together, we won't make progress and we'll go back to we're a numbers game and they look happy. And there's, that's going to end in one place only, and it's not good. Thank you very much. So have you guys got questions? Has Jerry made you think? Um, actually, I was um, interacting with one of our members who will remain nameless, um, and one of the things that we were kind of discussing as you went is actually, when I think about what you're thinking, talking about around happiness, how, how could we start to be thinking about that also as a lever for change <coughs> around the other issues we're trying to deal with in sustainability? So how might we make the link between what we were talking about before around maybe climate change and really helping our our people feel like they really belong. It'd be just that'd be quite an interesting thing to hear your view on. Happiness is a deeply personal thing. And the work we're doing and the work I've studied overseas is that it is everything from feeling accepted at work because I'm a bit odd, particularly I guess diversity is a big factor at work. So if you know if I feel welcome at work, right away I relax. Secondly, we all want to belong. And often those people who, who behave in the most antisocial way are acting out their desire to belong. And we want to feel that we're recognized for who we are authentically, not that we're designed to fit some plastic template, if you like. So I would say if a business takes the time and invests in the tools to truly understand what happiness is for the people, and that's individually and in a shared sentiment space, that's recognition. That's validation. That's saying, you are welcome. We like you for who you are. Mm. Let's go somewhere together. And that, I think, is the first step to getting people up to be authentically present in the business, mm. to say, where can we go? Where can we make a difference together? Mm. So it's kind of a ground state thing. If we're, trying to, if we're trying to get our organizations to be on this journey as a whole, if we can tap into people's yeah. happiness, we can happiness, go faster. Happiness tends to make barriers fall away. It brings forward the people, the quiet ones, the introverts who feel usually shy and hide in a corner. They suddenly feel that their voice can be heard. And it makes people who often 
come across as cold, unapproachable, actually open up as, here's who I really, I really want to be, who I really am. Mm. So happiness makes me turn up. That was a good question, wasn't it? Now, now you, <laughs> even if I do say so myself, <laughs> clearly not an introvert. Um, anything, any questions from the audience? Anything you'd like to ask? Um, yes, of course. Can you change someone who is a numbers person to become someone who understands or at least appreciates the benefits of happiness? I'm just going to repeat that so anyone who's stayed on live stream knows. So how do you help a numbers person um, change, I think was the word you used, and then you corrected yourself, didn't you, to become someone who appreciates happiness. So from a manager point of view, I understand you. Change your manager or CEO or whatever, yeah. That's a harder question than yours. Um, <laughs> I can only speak from my experience. A lot of the time it comes from working with leaders, and we do a little bit of executive coaching that way, Sometimes leaders are held back because they're not sure even who they are themselves. They're fulfilling a role because they think they're supposed to fill a role. Now look at some CEOs out there who clearly bring their entire personality and their heart to work. Mm. And, and personally, I can tell the difference right away. You're sitting there holding back saying, I need to report, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going, what really matters to me is that you all feel part of something here. So I think a big part of it is can that leader, and the jargon is self-actualized, can that leader actually open up and acknowledge who he or she is? And can we connect that to the role that they're in? Does who or sh who you, he or she is actually flow into the role you think you're fulfilling? If you're just here, tick a, a balance book, perhaps that's not going to satisfy what you actually want inside. If you are here to make a difference, yes, grow a brand by all means, own a market by all means, but acknowledge and nourish the people on whose shoulders you do it, I think we have the answer. And again, Simon Sinek has a lovely analogy. He talks about when he was embedded in the US Marines, and I was eight years a Royal Marine, so I know the situation. <coughs> None of the men and women on the front line in combat are there for the president, the flag or the anthem, <coughs> excuse me. They're there for her beside me and him beside me because they would give their life for me. Mm. In business, Cynic says, cynical perhaps, some CEOs sacrifice the lives of those beneath them to benefit me, the CEO. Have I answered your question? No. <laughs> I haven't. Oh, then, okay. It simply, comes, it simply comes down to, here is the empirical evidence that understanding and elevating happiness makes the business make more money. I can show you case studies this thick. The details to someone I know. <laughs> <laughs> or, and, and often they go hand in hand, we will work together to understand who are you, CEO, GM, CFO, who are you really, and what part of you is in this role? Mm. And I think those two polarities, and of course there will be some who go, I don't get it, I don't want it, I won't be here. And I can't help that. We can't help that. And I, you know, I suppose part of my perspective on this as well is that part of, um, part of what I know about so many of you that I work with is that one of the hard things about being in a sustainability role is you're not just leading change for your business and change for New Zealand, but also you have to lead by how and who you are. And so that's one of the great tensions of these sorts of roles, right, is actually a lot of the leadership has to come from us. And so how can we be differently in the world and, and demonstrate to those around us that this might be a different way of leading without ever necessarily having the tools to change the people who... Can I add something to this as well? Yeah. The That's just my perspective, Jerry. No, I'm hey, not I, the expert. I, I like think you. I like it. Well, I don't oh also be an expert. <laughs> An emerging area of business performance is also workplace culture. And sometimes people start with a workplace culture and go, well, it's fun to be here. They all smile. We have a glass of wine each Friday. But does it impact my bottom line? And I would say workplace culture has to connect to purpose, has to connect to happiness. And the evidence of a workplace culture that's working is often you get the senior managers working side by side with the factory floor staff. And when you operate in culture as a senior manager, you're operating as Abby or Jerry, not as CEO, CFO. 
Culture is about where all human beings, regardless of our mm. shape, size, orientation, doing something together because we belong. And, and culture is far now, culture is tribe. But tribe has to be oriented towards the purpose we set as our critical purpose is the emotional summation of why I come to work. I'm tired, I've got a sick child, I'm hungover, but the impact we have together on our customers' lives, communities' lives, makes me come here and do it with a smile and a full heart, wholeheartedness. And that only really works if I know what makes you all happy. So, unless there are any other questions from the audience, and I'm seeing some shuffling, which makes me think your glasses are empty. Um, and there's nothing from live stream. No questions from the crew who are watching. All right, we might draw it to a close. Thank you so then. much. No, thank you, Jerry, and and sorry for trying to cut you off before you cool. even started. <laughs> See, it was worth waiting for. Um, so, kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you very much, Namiki Nui, and have a good evening. And stay if you can, and if you can't, don't. And we'll see you the next time. <laughs>